Chapter 1 in the Boglehead textbook talks us about <laughs> talks about choosing a sound financial lifestyle. Now, I'm recording this at my house and there's a, a lot of noise at my house. I'm in a quiet room, but we can still hear sounds, so hopefully they're not too loud. But uh, before I start talking about the different financial lifestyles, I want to just introduce the concept of net worth. Basically, if we take all the assets that a person has and we subtract all the liabilities or the, the debts, the money that they owe on the assets that they have, that will give us a person's net worth. At the moment, if you're young, your net worth is probably negative. But as the goal is, as you get older, to have a positive net worth. And I'm nearly 50. At this point in my life, I do have a positive net worth. But when I was 20, my net worth was most assuredly negative. I mean, it wasn't something I was proud of. It was just due to the fact that I was going to school. I wasn't working full-time at my career um, and so I didn't generate enough income to support my spending habits, in essence. And I had a negative net worth. So what kinds of things are assets? If you own a house, if you have you know, nice jewelry, a car, your retirement plan. Like my retirement plan is my biggest asset at the moment. And probably will continue to be so. So, uh, you know, a savings account, basically any investments that you've got. Liabilities would include things like a car loan, a mortgage, any student loans that you've got, you know, and other, other debt. So like a, a credit card. So let's say that I have, I'm, I'm going to do a, basically do a net worth calculation. And I'll do somebody that's approximately my age. And I like to draw these as T accounts is what they're called. My background is in accounting in finance and in accounting we did a lot of T accounts. So I put my assets on the left, my liabilities on the right. So I own a house and I'm not going to use my actual numbers but let's say my house is worth $350,000. I'm actually going to use numbers that are very easy <laughs> to add and subtract because I don't have a calculator handy. Um, my worst nightmare. And then let's say I have a car, and my car is worth, again, just using nice round numbers, I'll say $20,000. And then I've got my uh, 401k plan, that's my retirement plan. And and let's say I've got 200000 in that. Um, I have a savings account, and I'll just put 50000 in that. And let's say my checking account, I have 5000 And then let's say I've got some other items like jewelry, etc. 10000 So I want to sum all of those. So that's going to be, I'll do my math in a weird way. So that's 550, 600, 620, 630, 635. I'm hoping that's correct, but I might be wrong. So, now liabilities, I borrowed money from the bank to buy my house. I have a mortgage, let's say that's 200000 Let's say I have a car loan of 10000 And let's just say on my credit card, I owe 5000 
and, and you know, just for the sake of argument, let's say I've got a student loan too. And I'll put that at 30000 So that's 230, 240, 245. I'll put that down here. So now what I want to do is take my total assets, subtract my total liabilities. So that looks like it's going to be 390,000. Four. Yes. Okay. So this is my net worth. And what we typically see happen is, again, people in their 20s have negative net worths. Once they and these are just very much generalizations. As they hit their 30s, their net worth becomes positive. And for most people, their net worth is the highest right before they retire. And then once they retire, they stop working, they stop generating income, they start uh, spending the money in their 401k plan. And so their net worth starts to drop. Not because they have lots of debts, necessarily, but because they start decreasing their assets. I would love it if y'all weren't like the typical American. Uh, the typical American does not have enough saved for retirement. The typical American has, by age 50, only about 150000 saved for retirement, which is a horribly low amount. Uh, your your goal, I hope, is to become financially independent. At at some age prior to retirement, um, you know, maybe when you're 50. I don't know what your goal will be, how old you'd like to be when that happens, but basically to the point where you don't need to rely on loans to get by and you're able to retire and live a lifestyle that you want by the age that you'd like to. So I will have several practice problems that show how to calculate net worth. And I will have a link to those on the website. There will be a test question about net worth. I actually use this website, mint.com, that interfaces with, with all my bank accounts, with my, my uh, actually, it looks up my address on Zillow and looks up the current market value of the house. It's not necessarily extremely accurate and um, interfaces with my retirement account. It can't withdraw money or anything like that, but what it does is it tallies my net worth for me on, on a um, daily basis if I'm interested. I just log in and it goes to my bank accounts and pulls the current amounts in those. It looks at my brokerage account, looks at the current value of all my stocks, etc. Combines all of those to calculate my net worth for me and it's just really handy. So, there are three different financial lifestyles that they talk about in the Boglehead textbook. I have, <laughs> I have been each of these, and the first group are the borrowers. Basically, they charge lots of things on their credit card, and they don't pay off their credit card down to zero. I mean, like, now, I... I charge lots of things on my credit card, but every month I pay that bill off in full. The reason that I use my credit card is because I get a lot of cash back on my purchases. So I actually get about $1,000 a year in cash back just for using my credit card, and I never pay any interest on the charges that I make. That's the way you should be using a credit card. 
Um, you shouldn't be continually carrying a balance on your credit card. Credit cards have huge interest rates, and that's costing you a lot of money to carry a balance from month to month to month on their credit card. But that's what borrowers do. So they charge on their credit card and they don't pay it off. So basically every month they're building up an extra a balance on their credit card. They tend to get new cars every few years. I never did that. So, and not because their old cars don't work anymore, but they just like new cars. Buying a new car is expensive. You you pay a lot in terms of depreciation. As soon as you drive that, that new car off the lot, its value is drops substantially. Many people argue that you should never buy a new car. You should always buy used cars. Borrowers also tend to take out home equity loans and they don't use the loans to improve their homes. They use it to take vacations or, or what have you. Now, because this cat class is... Uh, there are no prereqs. You don't have to be a business major to take this class. You can come from any any discipline to take this class. I'm going to spend a little time explaining what a home equity loan is. So, let's say my house is currently worth $350,000. I'm just using the examples, the numbers that I have up here. Um, so that's the current market value of my house. And I, I do owe money on it. I still have that mortgage using the numbers from above. That was 200000 The difference between those two numbers is the equity in my house. And you can go to a bank and take out a home equity loan. The house itself serves as collateral on that loan. So I could potentially borrow up to $150,000 and get a loan for that. I could pay it off over 20 years or so at a pretty low rate. Um, and a lot of borrowers do that. And they'll take money out, not necessarily all of the equity, but some of it. And they'll spend it on, like I said, a vacation or, you know, braces for their kids or I don't know what. But they're basically spending, like if I, if I took out a home equity loan and I spent it on, I spent, I don't know, $5,000 going on a cruise. I don't, I don't know what I would spend it on, but um, that cruise is something that's just used up in a very short term. But I'm paying, I'm going to be paying off my home equity loan over 20 years or so. So I'm taking a short-term vacation and spending, or paying it off over the long run, that's going to pay, result, sorry, in a lot of interest that I'm going to be paying over the years. It's not necessarily a good idea. And then uh, many borrowers, most all borrowers, tend to have a negative net worth. Their debt is far in excess of their assets. Oh, and just as an interesting aside, um, you know, I've been tracking investments and savings for about three decades now, and I just noticed some interesting things, and I'm always reading articles in the news about how much or how little people save. And I'm, I'm always shocked by it. But in the 1980s, Americans tended to save about 10% of their income. That's not too bad. In, but what we have seen is it has slowly gotten worse. In the 1990s, Americans only saved about 6% of their income. In 2000, it was about negative 1%. So they actually spent more money than they earned. That's not good. And then um, in 2008, we had the financial crisis. That actually 
kind of woke people up a little bit and made them realize, you know, this was pretty stupid. Spend, we're spending too much money. We're not saving enough. And they started saving uh, more than they had been in, in 2000. And they boosted their savings rates. Now it's about at 4%. And, but Americans save, for the developed countries, Americans are, are some of the worst savers. People in Japan uh, tend to save quite a bit more money than Americans do. We've seen, seen this general trend across most developed countries, though. The second financial lifestyle that they talk about in the Boglehead book is the consumer lifestyle. And this is what most Americans are like. Basically, they live paycheck to paycheck. <laughs> and my kids are having a good time. Um, basically, consumers pay little attention to their net worth. Oops. They only focus on their monthly expenses. So, something that happened to me, and I, I don't actually follow the consumer lifestyle anymore, uh, but again, like I said, I have been each of these different lifestyles over the years. It's, again, not something I'm proud of, but um, a tree, <laughs> a tree fell on my car in the middle of a giant windstorm last year and uh, totaled it, so I had to get a, a new car. If I were following the consumer lifestyle, what I would really look at is, you know, how much extra, well, how much money do I have available to spend on a new car payment? And so let's say I could only afford $300 on a monthly payment for my new car. So what I would do is work with that and then figure out how much money I could afford to borrow based on a five-year plan or even a six-year plan uh, through the loan through the car company or the bank. And then that would drive how expensive of a car I could afford to purchase. That's not necessarily the best way to go about it. I should be paying attention to, you know, how much is this going to impact my net worth? How much am I willing to have my net worth decrease if I purchase a new car with a loan? I'm not going to tell you what I did. <laughs> um... Consumers also tend to have little or no savings and no plan to change that. They also tend to have 401k plans and again, um, a 401k plan, and I'll put just the word retirement plan here, is something that's traditionally offered by employers and an employer might um, for every dollar that you put into your 401k plan they might put in 50 cents to, to match um, so many consumers might have 401k plans but they don't participate fully so participate. I'll just use um, mine as an example. Uh, hmm. Well, I, I will go ahead and, and do that. Um, actually, no, I won't. I'll use a different one. So let's say you work for an employer and your employer offers the following plan. And, and there are lots of different types of specifications 401k plans can have. But let's say this is yours. Let's say that your employer will match you 
dollar for dollar up to five thousand dollars annually and you put in three thousand dollars this year into your 401k plan that means your employer Your employer is not going to put in five thousand. They're only going to match you dollar for dollar based on how much you put in. So you put, I'm sorry, you yeah, I'll say you put in three thousand. Your employer only puts in three thousand. If you had put in five thousand, your employer would have put in five thousand. If you had put in six thousand, your employer would have only put in five thousand because they capped their match. I said um, at five thousand dollars. So if you follow this particular strategy, you're essentially giving up collecting a match of $2,000 a year from your employer. So you're giving up free money. That's what I mean when I say that consumers have 401k plans but they don't fully participate. If your employer is matching you, you should try to fully participate up to that match. Now, not every employer will match dollar for dollar. They might do just 25 cents to the dollar. Uh, the best 401k plan that I've ever seen, it wasn't mine, it was a friend of mine. Her employer matched her $3 for every dollar that she put in. That was an amazing 401k plan. And then the third type of uh, lifestyle are the keepers. And I would say I fall under the keeper lifestyle now and discipline in my life. It took me a while to get there. Um, but keepers focus on building their net worth. So they're paying down their debts. They're saving more money in their 401ks. They're building up those assets. So that should be an A. And they pay themselves first. So basically they save a portion of every paycheck. And just, by the way, um, As you read through this Boglehead textbook, they, they offer their opinions about different things, and I agree with a lot of them, which is why I chose this particular textbook, but I don't necessarily agree with everything that they say. But um, the Boglehead textbook suggests that you should save about 20% of your paycheck. I think that's perhaps a little excessive. I don't, You don't necessarily need to save that much, but it really depends on what you've done in the past and what you're doing now. If you are quite young and you've started saving when you're young, and by young I mean 20-ish, then, if, and if you're talking about saving for retirement, which could be 40 years away, you might well get by without saving 20%. You might not need to save 20%. Maybe you only need to save 15% or perhaps even less. But if you waited until you were 35 to start saving for retirement, you're probably going to have to save quite a bit more to build up enough in your retirement account to live decently. And then um, a keeper may borrow, but they'll borrow prudently. So, for instance, I consider myself a keeper, but I have debt. I have a mortgage, but it's a very low interest rate. Um, and I did buy a car when the tree fell on my car, but I got it. At, my loan is at a zero percent interest rate, so I have some debt, but it's not a whole lot, and it's all at low rates. And again, I do use my credit card, and it has a high rate. I honestly don't know what rate they charge me for my credit card because I never carry a balance from month to month so I never actually get charged interest on that card so what rate they charge me on that card isn't, isn't necessarily relevant for me 
since I don't pay interest on it. I'm more concerned on that card that it not have an annual fee because I don't want to pay an annual fee just to use that. It, it would reduce the benefit of getting my cash back. And something else I want to talk about um, is establishing an emergency fund. Now, experts argue that we need to save three to six months of living expenses in an emergency fund before you start investing money. So let's say, I'm just easy, using numbers that are pretty easy for me to multiply without a calculator. Let's say my living expenses are $2,000 a month. Um, and let's say I would be content with just having four months of, li of living expenses. So I would need to have $8,000 set aside into something that I could fairly easily convert to cash should I need it. And so that's basically, I want to put that money in an easy to access account. And I'll, I'll actually put in an easily convertible to cash account. So like, um, you know, you might argue, well, you know, I've got that much money built up in equity in my house. Well, the, there are only two ways to gain access to equity in your house. The first is to sell your house, and maybe you don't want to do that, because selling your house uh, generally results in a, a huge commission that you have to pay to a real estate agent. Or you can take out a home equity loan. Well, it might turn out that you can't get a home equity loan for whatever reason. I know in 2008, when the financial crisis happened, banks were extremely reluctant to give out home equity loans, and it took them a couple of years to get to the point where they would offer home equity loans again. Um, that isn't to say that you couldn't get a home equity loan at that time. It was just much, much harder to do so. So having... $8,000 in home equity doesn't really count as emergency savings. So you need to have this money in your savings account or certificate deposit, for example. It needs to be what we call liquid, liquid money. And by liquid, we mean easily convertible to cash without losing value. Like I have equity in my car, but the only way to get that equity is to sell my car. And maybe it would be it take me a month to find somebody who's willing to pay me fair market value for that car. Well, if I need my equity out much faster, then I would have to lower the selling price of the car. So if I drop the price low enough, then sure, I could find somebody to buy it from me tomorrow, but I wouldn't get nearly as much cash for it. So that wouldn't be considered a liquid asset. Stocks, though, are liquid assets because I can, well, I, I'll go ahead and say they are very liquid in the sense that I can sell them quickly. When the stock market is open, I can contact my broker and tell them to sell my shares of Apple and they'll be sold within 30 seconds. But, I mean, as an interesting tidbit, today the stock market dropped about 2% in a single day. That's a huge drop for a day. Um... I don't necessarily want to be selling my stocks when the market's dropping. That's not a good plan. So we don't typically keep our emergency money in the stock market or in our house. Or, and by in our house, I mean in home equity. Um, instead, what we might do is put it in a savings account. Or what some people do is use um, what's called a laddered CD strategy. And I wanted to talk about that. I have some money in a laddered CD, and I'm just going to use the $8,000 amount that I was talking about before. If you go online and you Google certificate of deposit, you're going to find different banks that will offer you different rates if you put money into their CDs for a certain amount of time. And CDs can have CDs have uh, maturity time periods, and they could range from as short as one month 
all the way up to perhaps about five years. I don't think I've seen one that has longer than five years until it matures. But generally speaking, the longer the time period you agree to commit your money to that certificate of deposit, the better rate you'll get. So a CD that you agree to commit to for five years might offer you a 2% rate. But a CD that you only commit to f to leave it in the bank for a month is going to offer you a much, much, much lower rate. I'm going to say 0.6%. I didn't Google any um, before I started this, this recording. But maybe... Uh, Maybe later I'll, I'll look some up and post them, post links. That's probably what I'll do. And then also the more money that you agree to commit to the CD, the better the rate you'll get. So if I agree to put $500 into a one-month CD and let the bank use it for that month, I'm not going to get a very good rate. But if I agree to commit 25000 to a CD for five years, I'm going to get a much better rate. So, what I have discovered over the years is I don't tend to have uh, a lot of major emergencies that cost money. So while I have a decent amount of emergency savings, I have locked that emergency savings into certificates deposit. I can sell them before their maturity date, and I'll have a penalty in lost interest, but I'm okay with that. So far, I mean, I've had these latter CDs for a while, and I've never had to sell one. But the idea behind a laddered CD is you, you look at how much money you've got, and you decide what's the longest amount of time you're willing to have it locked up for. And by locked up, I just mean the bank holds that money, they use it for things, they give loans to people, and they earn, you know, charge those people interest and earn a return on the money that you've agreed to let the bank use. And in return, they're going to pay you some rate. Let's say, for my purposes, I'm, I'm going to just choose four years. The reason is because 8000 is is easily dividable by 4 and that gives me $2000. So let's say I take $2000 and what I'll do is I'll lock it into a 1 year CD. The second 2000 of the 8000 I'll lock into a 2 year CD. The third 2000 I'll lock into a 3 year CD. And the fourth 2000, I will lock into a four year CD. I've put the same amount of money in each. You don't have to. Um, this one I've locked up for a fairly short period of time. They might pay me about 1.05% on that one. The second one, because I've agreed to lock it in for a longer period of time, they might charge me a slightly better rate. The third one, it's it's in for an extra year, so they're going to pay me a slightly better rate. I'm just making these numbers up, but they're not that far off from what I'm actually getting. And then the fourth CD, I'm locking in for four years, so they're going to pay me, again, a better rate. And what will happen is, so let's say today... I open an account with that bank and I transfer $8,000 into it and I use the $8,000 to buy these four CDs. Time will pass. Eventually, one year will pass and this first CD, which I will call CDA, will mature. And so what I'll have them do is take this $2,000 plus the interest that it earned and I will use it to buy a, a four-year CD. So after one year, I, this one matures, and it will I will buy a four-year CD. Because this one, now after that year has passed, only has one year to maturity, this one two years to maturity, this one three years to maturity. Now I've bought a fresh one that has four years to maturity. 
So I'm building a ladder. There are steps to the maturity dates on my series of CDs. And I'll just keep doing that. And I mean, you don't have to use such a long time period like I do. You could buy a one month CD, a two month, and a three month CD. And you could $500 in each of them. Now, you're not going to get much better rates than your savings account, though. To get much better rates than your savings account, because again, my savings account only pays me a half a percent, I have to put a decent amount of money and lock it in for a decent amount of time. Okay, I, um, I'm going to do one last little side note and just talk about retirement a little bit. Because I am just a, a firm believer in starting to save for your retirement when you're in your 20s. That's going to make your retirement so much easier, <laughs> so much more affordable if you start when you're in your 20s. I started when I was in my 20s, but I know plenty of people who didn't. And I know plenty of people who didn't save enough for retirement and who are now retired and they're suffering. I don't want that to happen to you. So if you started saving for retirement in your 20s, you would be doing yourself a huge, huge favor. So I will spend a fair amount of time in this class talking about retirement. The idea that they, they experts talk about retirement as a three-legged stool. The first source of funds for retirement is Social Security. Now you've probably heard that Social Security is, is not going to be fully funded in all likelihood by the time you retire, they're going to have to do some things to fix it. By the mid-2030s, it's expected to only be 75% funded. So they're either going to have to uh, boost the age that they start paying out retirement or start collecting more. Right now, I believe they collect 6.5% from employees, and then the employers pay in another 6.5%. So they might have to boost that to 7.5% or 8% in order to collect enough money from workers to pay out Social Security benefits. So you may not even want to rely on Social Security. You simply might not think it will be there by the time you retire. The second source of retirement funding is your pension or your 401k plan through your employer or a 403b plan if you work for a nonprofit. Um, there's been a huge change in the last 30 years in uh, employer sponsored retirement plans, and I'll talk about those in a little bit. And then the third big source of retirement funds are your own personal savings. Unfortunately, many people have neither of those and they rely solely on Social Security in their retirement. Social Security was never meant to fully fund your retirement. It was only meant to replace about 40% of your income. So you can see that people who didn't save any money for retirement are not living particularly well during their retirement. So I want to talk about employer-sponsored retirement plans. So there are two types. The first is, is what's called a defined benefit plan. And these are the old pension funds. Like my ex father-in-law has a pension plan. And basically when he retired, he knew that throughout his retirement, his employer was going to pay him the average of his last three years of salary. 
So I, I don't really know what he made, but let's say he made fifty thousand, then sixty thousand, and then seventy thousand, just to make the math easy. So the year he retired, that's what he was making the year before. He made sixty thousand the year before that, fifty thousand. So basically, they added those up. That's eight hundred eighty thousand. They divided it by three to get sixty thousand. So the first year of his retirement, he received. Um, sixty thousand dollars as a pension. Then I'm sure they boost it for inflation every year. Um, a lot of employers don't like pension plans because they're expensive. So in, in, and 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 they're really um, it's difficult to measure the liability an employer is going to have with a pension plan. Like um, Bill is the name of my ex-father-in-law. He's quite healthy. He could live until he's 95. His employer, former employer, who's now paying his retirement, has no idea when he's going to die. It would be better for them if, you know, financially, if he died tomorrow instead of living until he's 95 years old. But again, the fact that they don't know how long he's going to live makes makes the liability that they have associated with paying his pension uncertain. And for that reason and others, employers switched from defined benefit plans to defined contribution plans. And that's the type of plan that I have. And I actually have what's called a 403B plan because I work for a nonprofit, but there's also 401K plans. And, and they're uh, fairly similar. But with my 403B plan, my employer contributes to my retirement account, but once I no longer work for that employer even either because I quit or get fired or I retire they will no longer contribute to my retirement plan my goal then is to build up enough money in that retirement plan to have enough to live off of once I retire what Western has agreed to do though is match me my, match my contributions. They have defined what they are willing to contribute toward my 403B plan. And in my case, what Western will do is match me dollar for dollar uh, up to the maximum contribution, which I believe is 18500 a year. So if I put in $20,000 into my retirement account this year, Western would only put in 18500 If I put in $10,000, Western will match another 10000 But they won't put in any more than I'll put in. So, with a defined contribution plan, they're defining what they're willing to contribute and they're setting their maximums. Whatever balance I have in my retirement plan is all that I, I've got uh, when I retire. Western won't ever add any more once I retire. And so my goal is to build that retirement account up to a decent amount, you know, several million dollars, because I don't know how old I'm going to be when I die, and I won't, at which point I won't need that money anymore. Western is only helping me by contributing some money to it every time I contribute money. That's a lot different type of a plan than this pension plan. When I run out of money, if, I should say if, not when, uh, hopefully I won't, but if I run out of money um, after I retire because I didn't save enough, that's my problem. Western's not going to help me. But with this pension plan that Bill has, um, he doesn't have to worry about that. He will get paid his pension until he dies. So, most employers nowadays are doing defined contribution plans. That's a, a huge um, change from what people get to uh, deal with because it's up to me to figure out how much to set aside of my paycheck every month. Um, 
and it's it's up to me to decide how to allocate my assets like should I put 80% in stocks 20% in bonds should I put 100% in stocks should I put 50% in stocks 50 in bonds I make those decisions so that's why this personal investing class is really important for essentially anyone who's ever going to participate in a 401k or a 403b plan because you have to make all those decisions yourself so you need to understand this information